things and what may be being investigated between the senator and those companies. Well, we've taken a look at some of the emails that have come to light that the grand jury hasn't even had access to at this point. And you see these companies losing out at a federal bid back in January of 08. They contact the senator and say, Senator, we'd like to learn more about what the Treasury Department said about our bid. We didn't win. We want to learn for next time so that we can do a better job. The senator's staff contacted him back and said, that's great. Let's get together. Let's meet. And then it begins to morph into something very, very different. There's talk of coming to an office, coming to have a meeting having a fundraiser, and all of these starts, sorts of issues start to morph into something more. Then, when you look at February, just about a month after this is happening, you've got that $28,000 annual contribution that was asked for for the majority makers. That's part of the Senate Committee or the uh, National Republican Senatorial Committee campaign group that had asked for all of that money in exchange, in theory, to try to make some of these regulations go away. At the same time, they're asking, hey, we're going to have some of these regulations coming down the pike, you may want to have Doug Hampton on board. He's worked with our staff. Take a look at him. He's the sort of person that can help you with this. And a lot of those folks were leery about how it all went down, but they were so desperate for help from their state senator that they looked at it and said, maybe this is something we need to take a look at. It, do we know, and this is sort of jumping ahead to the punchline, I guess, but do we know if Senator Ensign ever did make interventions on those specific regulations that he was raising with those companies? It doesn't even appear that those regulations at this point were real. We haven't heard from those companies say that these were serious issues that we were really concerned about. Again, they were talking about getting a bid. That's why they came to the senator's office in the first place. We're not sure about the possibility of these regulations and whether they were actually real issues that those companies had to even deal with. One last question for you, Jonathan. We keep contacting the National Republican Senatorial Committee about this. We have ever since we first learned that one of the things that, uh, that, Jonathan, uh, that, 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 that Senator Ensign did uh, in conjunction with this affair, from all appearances, is to have put the teenage son of the woman he was sleeping with on the Republican Party's payroll at the NRSC. The NRSC consistently tells us we're a whole different animal now. We're a whole different committee now. John Ensign isn't in charge anymore. We really don't feel like we have to answer any questions about that. Have you you been able to sense whether or not the NRSC, the Republican Party as a whole, feels at all vulnerable because of the way they have been roped into this with receiving this federal subpoena now? Well, we've talked to a number of Republicans and strategists as well, and a lot of them are really upset, clearly, at what had happened with Senator Ensign and what he had done over the last few years. And they feel like they're left holding the bag for his drama, for his baggage, and other issues that he's brought forward. That this was a committee that was pushing very, very hard. They still are, but the staff is all but gone from the folks who were involved when the senator was uh, running that committee. And so you look at these folks and say, anyone that knew the senator, anyone that worked with him, at this point looks at that relationship as a big liability and that's definitely something that that committee and this party has to deal with is moving forward with the baggage that he is still in this senate will be in this senate for more than a year at least without a resignation and they have to deal with that for sure he's, even as he says he's running for re-election uh, it's an incredible story and getting more and more incredible all the time uh, jonathan humbert investigative reporter with klas tv uh, doing yeoman's work on this thank you so much for joining us appreciate it thanks so much rachel do you remember Ralph Reed, the Christian coalition guy who got all caught up, caught up in the Abramoff scandal a couple of years ago? Ralph Reed was never indicted over the Abramoff situation, but he was implicated by the Senate investigation into that scandal for having secretly taken Abramoff money to dupe conservative Christians who trusted him into thinking that they were doing the Lord's work when really they were just taking political stands that helped out Jack Abramoff's lobbying shop. That's called Classy with a K. Uh, Ralph Reed is back now. Uh, he now has a new gig. He is selling something called Faxgrams. What are Faxgrams? Well, if you're someone who is opposed to health reform right now, Ralph Reed says he will fax members of Congress for you to tell them just how angry you are. The goal is to, quote, bury Congress with an avalanche of Faxgrams in the next 24 hours. How do you get in on this sweet Faxgrams deal? Easy. Just click that red box. It says, quote, I would like you to put my name on an emergency faxgram today to every member of Congress, including my congressman and my two U.S. senators, for $24.95. <laughs> Saying no to Obamacare. Just $24.95, and Ralph Reed will send all of those faxes for you. 
Just $24.95. Act now. Only while supplies last. Everything must go. We take checks or money orders. Did I mention it's only $24.95? All right, first of all, is everybody really still faxing these days? Also, $24.95, doesn't that sort of seem like a lot of money to, you know, fax, <laughs> fax a piece of paper? <laughs> Ralph Reed's sweet deal here is actually what the anti-health reform world is starting to look like in the last few days they have left. Uh, for example, I've been seeing these countdown clocks everywhere online. Uh, the one on the left is the one from the anti-health reform corporate faith grassroots group, uh, Americans for Prosperity. The one on the right is from the National Republican Congressional Committee. That's their code red countdown clock. You'll notice that the countdown clocks look very similar, but they're not actually on the same page. The time they're counting down to is different. I guess the code red one is faster, so maybe that's the one that's imparting more urgency about when the sky will fall. It's not entirely clear what these clocks are counting down to, but, but at least the one from the Republican Party makes it very clear what exactly you are supposed to do if the sight of the flashing bright red countdown clock does make you feel alarmed. Right next to the government healthcare takeover clock is the big red button that says donate now. The anti-health reform group Focus on the Family is apparently in money grab mode as well. As Mother Jones magazine first reported, Focus on the Family is busy making their last ditch effort to turn your fear about health reform into cash for them. They've sent out a fundraising pitch that reads, on the eve of one of the most historic votes, Focus Action is stretched thin. That's why I'm urgently asking you to help Focus Action with a special gift today. Please give as generously as you can. Six or eight months ago when groups like the Republican Party and Freedom Works and Americans for Prosperity were, were trying to stop health reform, they were whipping up lots of very evident fervor. They were holding pretty big marches on Washington. They were orchestrating takeovers of town hall meetings. And, and back then there was a real question of not only whether these groups would succeed at blocking health reform, but also whether these groups and the angry crowds that they ginned up would become an ongoing powerful force in American politics. I'm not sure that most of my friends in the media have caught up with this yet, but from our perspective here, it seems like this big vaunted anti-health reform movement is sputtering out. The big code red rally in Washington earlier this week, which featured a lot of big name Republican politicians, only managed to attract a few hundred people. Same thing for a Freedom Works rally uh, that happened at the same day. Uh, happened the same day. It, it was it was a very sparse turnout. They don't. I, I don't even think they had a PA system at that event. And then there was the drive around in circles and honk your horn if you're against health reform day. Uh, that was also kind of a bust. We had an inkling of this back in December when we were in Washington to cover a supposedly massive die-in that was going to happen on Capitol Hill. And do you remember this? We couldn't find anyone dying in when we went to cover it. But now just one day before health reform is to be voted on in the House, uh, yet another code red rally has been called in Washington. This one featuring a gentleman who claims to be Barack Obama's second cousin. Uh, and also the actor John Voight, Mr. Voight calling all freedom-loving Americans to attend in an open letter that said in part, Speaker Pelosi will stop at nothing to fulfill her corrupt conquests. She will bring all of the corrupt acorn liars to try to bully all the Democrats. If they're bullied into saying yes, it will destroy America. Now that health reform looks like it is going to pass, the effort to prevent that from happening appears to be sputtering out. As these groups all but concede that they're going to lose this one, rather than inspiring even more in the streets anger, the groups that have been trying to organize angry Americans to be afraid of health reform appear to be spending these last few days instead just trying to squeeze as much money as they can out of the dwindling number of people they are still able to upset. Joining us now is Dan Rather. Dan Rather is the host and managing editor of Dan Rather Reports on HDNet. Uh, Mr. Rather, thank you so much for being here tonight. Always a pleasure to be with you. Um, you started in the news business uh, in 1950 as an Associated That's Press true. reporter. Um, lots of presidents between then and now have tried to do national health reform. If it passes, does it seem like a landmark achievement to you in terms of just the, the magnitude of what was attempted legislatively? No question about it. I think it don't, not, not just seems to be. I think it will be. Mm. It'll be the signature achievement of this first term perhaps the only term, but it would be the signature achievement of, of President Obama's this term. And whether one likes it or not, disagrees with it or not, it, it takes up the line that started with Social Security, 
ran through Medicare and Medicaid, which was passed more than 40 years ago, 45 years ago, and uh, it'll be put in that category. And if it passes, and if it is uh, put into effect, I expect it will be in the first paragraph of uh, President Obama's obituary mm. that he passed uh, health care reform, partly because so many presidents... Uh, President Lyndon Johnson was successful, but President Nixon had a, had a run at this. Just about every president, with the possible exception of Jerry Ford, has at least thought about trying something along these lines. I don't mean this specific bill, but to get some kind of health care reform. When Lyndon Johnson was able to get Medicare passed in 1965, is, is there any useful comparison to make or contrast to draw between the political environment in which he was able to make that happen in '65 and 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 the way in the environment in which Obama has been able to presumably make this happen in 2010? Well, there's certainly a lot of contrast. First okay. of all, 